All right. Good morning. Welcome uh, to this Bellwether Education webinar with Janice Jackson, who's CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, and Emily Oster, who's an economist at Brown University, uh, who both uh, are working on the same problem, but from somewhat uh, different perspectives uh, in terms of the kinds of work they do. We are looking forward to a really uh, robust conversation on a really genuinely complicated question, how to deliver live instruction during a global pandemic. And it's certainly been a, a question that's been politicized and nationalized. We can talk about like whether or not that's been uh, helpful or not helpful. Uh, but I don't think any it, 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 that has served in some ways to like simplify it as if there's an obvious answer. And I think most people who are working close to it appreciate it's really complicated. There's an awful lot of, of trade-offs and considerations and just two really leading experts um, uh, and practitioner to help us get into this uh, question uh, today. Um, at Bellwether, I don't wanna uh, spend a lot of time talking about us, but if you're interested on our website, we have a number of uh, toolkits to help with issues like reopening um, uh, and delivering live instruction right now, considerations for schools and some other resources. Bellwether um, at, at our website, I encourage you to check that out. Um, logistics for this morning, briefly, uh, this is, uh, the webinar is closed captioned, so you should be able to see it in multiple modalities. And afterwards, it will live on our website, so it will be uh, available for people who couldn't make it uh, to be with us uh, live today. Uh, Emily, Janice, I know you're both really busy. Janice, you are like really swimming with the sharks right now, trying to sort this out in in your um, in, in your school district, which is certainly not a, a small or straightforward one. So we're really grateful uh, for you all taking the time. I think just to help people, because one of the things I've noticed about this debate is it's it, like a lot of education debates, it's like highly ascriptive. And so it'd be helpful to just hear in your own words, I'll start with you, Janice, like just should schools be open for live instruction right now? Why yeah. or why not? Well, first, thank you for having me. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to engage in this discussion in this format. Um, to answer the question, I definitely think schools should be open. Uh, my position on that hasn't changed um, throughout this process, although the information that we have with regard to COVID-19 and school openings and how to do that safely obviously has evolved over time. But I think for me, uh, we know a lot more today than we knew seven or eight months ago. And I think with the information that we have now, it is incredibly important for us to figure out how to have school and do it safely. Um, I remember sounding the alarm early on um, back in the spring where I think we did all school systems across the country did the right thing by closing. We didn't know anything about this disease. There wasn't a lot of data about spread. You know, a lot of us were concerned about some of the same things that have turned out not to be as big of big of a threat as we originally thought. And I know Emily's going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but I, I feel strongly that more energy uh, needs to be devoted to this question. Um, if I could Monday morning quarterback for a second, you know, when we made the decision um, to, to open up bars and restaurants and gyms and all those other things and schools were an afterthought, you know, that was incredibly discouraging as a lifelong educator because once again, education was put on the back burner. And what we saw as a result of that is that schools started to open up in places that had the money to do it. Um, that's the bottom line. Chalkbeat early on put out an article that showed 75% of white students were getting some version of in-person instruction and that number dropped dramatically for Black and Latinx. And a lot of that had to do with, number one, um, where students attend school, but a lot of it went back to uh, funding. Um, and so I do think that schools need to reopen. I also think we need funding in order to do it safely. Terrific. Emily, same question. I want to get into your work tracking and so forth. We're going to get into some of the practical considerations Janice is dealing with. But first, just the exact same question, like people ask you, I would say like if they come up to you in a bar and ask you, but nobody's in bars anymore. So, but should schools be open? Uh, yes or no uh, for live instruction and why and why not? Yeah, I mean, first of all, people are in bars. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would really, I would really highlight basically everything Jen said. So I, I think, yes, I think that schools should be open uh, for in-person instruction and that we, we can do it, um, that we can do it safely. And that sort of the last few months have shown that that is possible. Um, I would sort of also kind of harken back a little bit to kind of what we've learned, what I think we've learned in the last four months. So, you know, I think when we started kind of in August and the first schools opened in places like Georgia and Indiana, you know, we started collecting data. And the reason that we started doing that 
is partly because I thought, boy, we don't really know anything. Like these place schools are opening in places with really high prevalence rates. It may be that what will happen is we'll see huge outbreaks. And this is something we need to know. And I think our kind of like sense of what was what might have happened was really broad. And then I think what we've learned is that, you know, it's not that no one at school ever gets COVID, but we have learned that these are fairly low risk environments, that infection rates can be controlled. We are not seeing huge outbreaks. And, you know, particularly in places where people are wearing masks and, you know, we're doing some of these kind of additional ventilation, we can talk about that. Um, we are really seeing the possibility of, of safe in-person instruction. At the same time, we are seeing the losses to learning for kids, not just learning, but their socio-emotional health. We're seeing those losses are much larger for, uh, for Black and Latinx kids than for, than for white kids. Even in districts that are partially open, we're sort of seeing these underlying inequalities that were there before are getting, are getting bigger. And so I think for both of those reasons, we kind of have to invest in this, but it is going to take resources. It's not going to be free. And I think that's like, that's like a high level thing that I think everyone on all the sides of this are going to are agree, in agreement on is that we need money for you to do this because this is important. Now, is there with, with both of your answers, is there an unspoken caveat there of like assuming some level of, of not community spread, like some level, like, is you, are you giving a universal answer? Or are you saying, assuming that we have COVID in various communities somewhat in check, like, or yeah. is that, is that, a, I'm asking, how should someone hear that? Or is that an absolute answer? You think schools should basically be open for live instruction regardless? Well, let, I'll start because this has, you know, evolved a bit here and um, and people have seen this across the country. So we, uh, for a long time, focused on positivity rates, which, you know, I can't comment on whether that's the right approach or not. I'm not a, a physician. Um, but I, what I do think was positive about that is uh, it, it's easy, fairly easy for the common person to understand, which I think is in incredibly important. While I can't weigh in on what the right positivity rate should or shouldn't be, I do think that the public should know what we mean when we say we're following the science. And so when we put out our school opening plan initially in the summer, we didn't have a concrete number. Um, now with, again, Monday morning quarterback and some districts put those numbers out and they kind of back them into a corner and you start to have questions around what does 3% positivity mean? What does it mean in context? But I firmly believe that the public needs to know what we mean when we say we're following the science. So here in Chicago, in partnership with the city's uh, health department, we look at the weight the rate, I'm sorry, in which cases double. Um, our uh, healthcare uh, leader feels strongly that that gives more of an indication around COVID spread and kind of the pace with which it's spreading in the community, which I think is incredibly important, um, but it's also complex and hard to understand. I think that when we talk about it, what's essential in this environment, schools have to be a part of that conversation. We've seen schools across the country, you know, kind of go back and forth with reopening and remote, et cetera, which I, you know, I've been, you know, impressed and uh, shocked by, you know, some of the instability that has occurred as a result of that. But I think at the end of the day, making an effort a, a, a real full-throated effort to get kids back in school and continue their education is important because the fact is this, there's a lot that we don't, we still don't know about COVID, but we know a heck of a lot about what happens if kids aren't in school, especially black and brown students, which is majority of the students in CPS and students from low-income areas. We know what, we know about summer slide. You know, there have been comments made about the myth of learning loss. Learning loss is real and it is accelerated and even more heightened for our students who have added additional uh, disadvantages. So for me, you know, someone who has been immersed in this work for a long time and also see kind of the intersection between all the things we deal with here in Chicago, poverty, violence, et cetera. I know that our schools provide more than just learning for many of our families. And I, you know, I don't need as sophisticated a study as Emily has put together to tell us what's going to happen if students don't go to school. Uh, the last point I'll highlight is that we've seen dramatic decreases in enrollment after making so much progress in this area, especially with pre-K, which is, has been our strategy to level the playing field. And so we see fewer students enrolled in school. When you disaggregate that data, most of them are black. 
period. And so we know what happens if they don't have that, uh, that safety net, um, the safety nets that schools provide. And so for me, we know a lot about what happens if kids aren't in school. And for that, I feel like it's our responsibility to get them back in, in a safe space in schools. All right, Emily, like say any caveats there with your with your answer, I mean, in terms of, of community spread, I mean, we, you yeah. know, anything you've seen in your data, you, I think you've You've been one of the people who's been out there saying schools don't cause community spread there, like they reflect it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is, you know, I um, I think that these these metrics that are based on community spread I, are a little tricky. They get you into these situations like the 3% positivity rate, which are are like a little bit like that, that seem those, they kind of, as exactly as Janice said, it's sort of painted people into a into a corner. I would, I think we, we do need to have some consideration of, of, you know, community spread in these in these decisions. I think an ideal decision rule would also take into account in school spread um, and recognize that you know actually what we're worried about is people getting it at school. The reason to have a school closed is if people are getting it at the school. And so I think we need to be better at monitoring what is happening in schools. We need to be more responsive to closing schools if there is spread inside the school, even if there's not a lot of community spread. And similarly. If we are not seeing spread inside schools, then even if we are seeing spread in the community, it's not obvious that the solution to that is uh, is is closing schools. I think there is a sort of like a, a tangential also resource point here, though, which is that in places with a lot of community spread, we're having trouble keeping schools open because of staffing shortages, and that's just like a practical issue. You know, not that people got it at school, but because you know either they got it elsewhere or they're isolating because of exposure to somebody else. So I think that that means that like there are places where they've just, you know, places in North Dakota that have just told me, look, we didn't have any spread at school, but we had to close because we didn't have any teachers. We didn't have enough sub pools. And again, that's a resource question. That's not necessarily a COVID question. So before we get to some of those practicalities, let's just stay on this equity issue. Janice talked about the learning loss. So it seems like there's two things happening that one is there's just an enormous equity problem with students with both quality of education that they're getting and in a lot of cases, no education at all. And, you know, at Bellwether, we did analysis that, you know, we found more than 3 million kids have just vanished during this crisis who just simply can't be found right now. So, I mean, that's just, that's an unfolding sort of equity disaster. But then at the same time, those communities and those parents we're seeing in both public opinion research and in some evidence with sort of actual behavior where, where schools are open, are less likely to want their kids to come back. And those are communities that have been hit hardest, obviously, by COVID. Like, how should we how should we think about that? It's, it's, it seems like it's, both those things are happening at the same time and they're a little at odds with one another. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good question. And it's actually been kind of a source of frustration for me, the way people have used um, some of that data to justify not doing what's right. At the end of the day, we know what's best. We, we are experts and we know a year from now or two years from now, I've been saying this, we're going to be called on the carpet about how we educated students, how we educated special education students during COVID, how how much outreach was done to bring back the three million students that you talked about at Vanish. And so, you know, it's interesting to watch how this all unfolds. But at the end of the day, as an educator, I know that it is not OK that kids aren't in school. Um, I also think schools play an important role. You know, I tell people, uh, you know, when asked about this, if every student um, who, you know, is at home looks like, you know, the images we see on Twitter with the beautifully designed learning spaces who have engaged teachers and ensuring that they're being instructed and that all students are afforded that same opportunity with high speed internet and devices, et cetera. We could have a different conversation about that. I still think there are a lot of shortcomings with remote, um, but we could have a different conversation. That's not the reality. And so schools play an incredibly important role. We can help our students even with some of the behaviors that are necessary to mitigate the spread of COVID. Children are very resilient. Um, they can get a lot of information about COVID and those practices while in school and practicing it in a real environment. Many of our students and families, you know, their parents are essential workers. So they're exposed in a number of ways. They, they've been working throughout this entire process and we have championed these essential workers, but they're getting hit double, doubly, I would say. They're having to go to work and be exposed to COVID, yet their children are at home trying to figure out learning on their own. How does that make sense? Um, and so I think that I think that we have to have a real discussion about 
um, the role of education, in particular the role of education for our most vulnerable students, um, because schools can actually assist, in my opinion, um, because of the influence that teachers and school leaders have on their students and families. So I see it as a positive. And I think it's really important that we, in Chicago, for example, we haven't opened at all. And so I think we have to start. And I think when people see and trust the system, which there are real, real trust issues there that we have to overcome, I think they're more likely to start sending their kids to school. But that's never going to happen if we stay in this perpetual debate. <laughs> and that can't keep happening. So Emily, what would you add to that? And then let's pivot to also, so like this this issue, this, this equity issue we just raised, and then also pivot to like the how-to. How do you do this? How do you do this safely? How do you do this to Janice's point in a way that would build confidence with parents that this is this is a responsible decision. Yeah, I mean, I think that I would sort of highlight this last issue that like, you know, the first step is going to be the most difficult. And I think a lot of places that have, um, a lot of places that have opened have sort of said like initially we were, people were very, like the first days were very anxiety provoking. It looks a little different. Everyone's wearing a mask. It feels kind of weird. Like it's sort of, and then it, it, for many places, it very quickly normalized and partly because, and then people's confidence grew because we weren't seeing, you know, often weren't seeing a lot of cases in school or weren't, you know, things were kind of seemed more normal. They seemed, they seemed like they were going well. So I think that places that have, I think part of what helped New York kind of reopen even after that sort of like been crazy 3% closure episode, I think part of what helped was, you met and reopen and, and kind of limit some of the the pushback there was that you could say, look, we were open for these eight weeks and it basically went fine in schools, even as things were raising and were going up in the in the city. And I think that kind of, that that just realization, I think helped help people. So I think those first steps are good. And, but then we need to, we do need to think about how we can build trust. And I would say there's building trust with parents and there's building trust with, um, with educators. And, you know, I think I have always had this instinct about data, like, oh, we'll just show people data, we'll show people data. And like, I mean, I think data is great. And I would love to show people data, but I think we also need to to sort of recognize, and this is kind of part of these sort of first steps of opening. We need to recognize that um, that th there are, people are going to be afraid, and that like e evidence is not always as helpful with with combating fear as uh, as maybe it could be, I guess. Um, and so some of that is sort of thinking about what are the things we can do to make people feel safe. And what are the kinds of you know transparency that we um, that we need? You know how how are we going to be communicating to people what is going on so they don't feel like they're sending their kids off to school and they never find out like what is happening? You know how are we going to provide the kind of testing or monitoring or whatever it is for for teachers so they are feeling like you know they are valued and, and protected? I know John has thought a lot a lot of these things. I'm interested to hear um, what she's. But like, for me, those kind of like how do we rebuild the trust? Um, or build the trust around these things. That seems so, so key to me in getting to these first steps. Of yeah, I want to stay with you for a second and then hear from Janice on some of the tactical stuff. On this issue, do we have a prevalence problem here in the sense that social media, which is where a lot of people get information, has a really like distorting effect on the prevalence of different things because whatever the sort of outlier case is, that's the thing that goes around. It seems much more normal than it actually is. And so do we have a problem here where like, the schools where there has been problems and there's been sort of cluster outbreaks and so forth, those are the ones that get highlighted, those are the ones you hear about and sort of to use, to mix the metaphors, like all the planes that take off and land every day, you know, none of those ever make the news. I is that is that distorting people's sense of risk here? Cause you're not, you're, you're only hearing about the problems. You're not hearing about normalcy. I don't think that's what it is in this case. So I think I thought that at the beginning, like in the first like three days of school openings where I was like, look at that school in Georgia with all those kids in the hallway, you know, but actually like the, because there, this has been, these like big outbreaks have been so limited. Like you actually don't hear that much about this. I think that, I think that just hasn't turned out to be like the big thing. Now you do see sort of like teachers, there's been more focus on these teachers getting sick and sort of and, and that piece of it in the in the social media space. But I don't think that's the source of lack of trust um, on the on the parent kid side. I think it's partly just like, you know, particularly in communities that were so heavily hit by the by the virus, like you, you saw what happened and it's it's just really scary. And the idea of sending your kid off, you know, when they've been kind of locked in the house for months is just that's that's scary to think about doing. I mean, my kids go to in-person school and I the first days, you know, I was like, I was really confident in the school, but it was scary to be like, okay, they haven't been out in the house and now 
I'm sending them in this room with all these other people. Janice, walk us through then, let's pivot to this issue of how to. I mean, I feel like one of the reasons it's great that you're here today is like Chicago is a large system. It's also a very complicated system. Yeah. A lot of challenges with the communities you serve in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So if, if you guys can make this work, arguably you could make it work anywhere in, in the country. So what's the plan for, for yeah. making it work? What's the plan to make it safe for kids and for, and for adults in the schools? Yeah, well, again, New York was first, and um, so we should definitely give them credit for that. And we've learned a lot um, of what to do and also some, some mistakes to avoid. I think the first thing is uh, we put out the most comprehensive plan last month. Um, and what we heard from folks is that they wanted a comprehensive plan and they wanted more time in order to make a decision, um, which I think was the right move. Um, so what is going to happen is, number one, Every parent will have a choice. There are some parents who will uh, elect to have their children remain in a remote environment, and that's okay. But what's different about our plan is that we, for the first time, are allowing parents who want, and in some cases need their children to go to school to now have a choice. And so what that's going to look like um, starting on January 11th, we're gonna bring back our pre-K students and our students uh, with disabilities who are in our um, severe and profound cluster programs. We'll start with them bringing staff back. Um, and then over the course of the next two weeks, um, we will bring back kids in K through eight. Um, we have not uh, changed the plan for high schools just yet. They're still going to be remote, but that's something that we're continuing to work on and engage in our high school leaders. Um, in schools, depending on the opt-in rate, uh, if schools are able to uh, socially distance, we won't have more than 15 people in the classroom. In cases or classrooms where they're able to do that, students will come to school uh, four days a week. We're leaving Wednesdays as a, a, a remote learning day for everybody. That is to allow for um, cleaning, um, also to allow for more teacher prep time because it is going to be a heavier lift for teachers teaching simultaneously. That's something that we've been learning um, throughout uh, this process. But just like our teachers rose to the occasion in the spring to you know transition to a remote learning we feel confident that they'll be able to do that when students arrive in school a lot of the same protocols that we've seen across the board will be in place um, screeners are required before entering the building temperature checks um, students will be in pods. You know, we've done a lot of work to preserve the fidelity of the pods, not only to mitigate spread, but also in the event that there is a case, we will be able to limit the uh, students and staff that need to quarantine as a result of that. And so again, we haven't had an opportunity to test this plan out. Um, but what we have um, done, uh, we did offer learning hubs. So we have about 5,000 students who come to learning hubs. These are for essential workers and people who you know, need an alternative for, for child care. And we have not, just like the data has shown, we haven't seen the widespread um, outbreak in those learning hubs, nor have we seen it in the pre-K and early childhood programs that the city has been running. And so I'm just, you know, I'm looking forward to starting. I know it's going to be hard in the beginning. Beginning. Um, but again, we need an on-ramp and we need a pathway back to in-person schooling for all. And how's it been? I mean, I, th I, think it, I think it's a fair characterization to say that your teachers union has not necessarily been entirely supportive of everything you've, you've wanted to do. Um, that's in the newspapers there and yeah. so forth. What are the issues they're raising that you think are important issues that school districts around the country really need to think about and engage with? And where has this just become politicized? Yeah, well, first, I think we, we've been incredibly responsive to the things that they brought up. One um, in particular was the need for air purification in our classrooms. And so that was something raised um, over the summer that we were responsive to. We made an $8 million investment um, for the entire district. We bought 25,000 um, purification purifiers to go into the 25,000 classrooms we have. Um, we did an assessment of all of our classes. We made that uh, information public. Um, so that would be one example uh, of how we've been responsive. I think that the situation has been politicized, which I think is unfortunate. Um, there are legitimate concerns that I feel like we should be spending more time talking about things uh, around simultaneous instruction. There are legitimate concerns that teachers, uh, you know, rank and file teachers will have around that, that we just quite frankly don't get to because we've just kind of gone around the bend on an issue that quite frankly is the district, uh, the district and the city's decision to make, which is 
when do we have kids come back to school? So I, I feel like our conversations would be much more productive if we were focused on maybe a list of demands and things that need to happen. We finally received a list of those demands. Um, if you've been following the news here uh, last week, and many of them are, you know, just things that can't happen. We can't guarantee that COVID doesn't exist. Anyone who's able to do that would be the biggest rock star in this world. That's what we're all trying to get to. But how do we create an environment that is safe? And how do we ensure that our kids are, are being educated properly? Properly, especially the most vulnerable kids. That's really the question. Um, but unfortunately, it has become um, politicized here in our city. But what I will say, and this has been true with COVID, is it's not as, you know, black and white as it may appear. I get emails and letters and support from teachers who are like, I want to be back in school. I want my kids. I want to see my students. This isn't working for the children that I serve. There are a lot of parents who um, have stepped up. I wish we had the kind of parent um, support that I've seen in New York. Um, Emily talked about the, the you know, public pressure to go back to school. We should be hearing more of that here in Chicago. One of the things that we've been um, challenged by is that the that push has also become racialized a bit. Um, when we survey, it is our white parents who make up a smaller uh, population of the school system that are the most vocal and organized around this. And once again, people have used that to I'm not 100 percent sure what they've used that to do, um, but it's not the right thing. Uh, we know that our kids need to be in school. And again, I wish that there was much more public pressure from some of our parents to make that happen for their children, because I think that this is a crisis. And I don't think I'm being dramatic when I say that. I think this generation will be impacted throughout the rest of their educational career because they happen to be born um, at a certain time and happen to be in school during COVID-19. Do you all see any risk? I mean, anyone who's taught knows that teaching live instruction is challenging. It's, you know, it's one of those things that's easy to do badly, hard to do well. Um, remote teaching is hard. And my entire expertise on that is I taught remote for the first time this past semester. And it was an enormous learning experience. And Janice, so you talked about like helping teachers support that because the load is the load is going to go up on them. Is there any risk that if we go to these hybrid systems where parents have choice and so some parents are in and some parents are out? that we end up with like a two tier system and perhaps like the remote instruction ends up, the quality of it ends up ends up suffering. Because essentially we're taking two, we're asking teachers now to do two really challenging things when ordinarily, you know, doing one of them is, is pretty yeah. hard. Does that? I think, I think it's a fair question. Um, the fact that a matter is we're in a two tier system now. Um, you know, I think about my daughter who goes to an amazing school and her teachers are working hard and she's thriving in remote learning. I'm like, wow, you know, this is great, but she has every resource, like many um, students who come from affluent families, she has every resource to be successful. That's not the same experience. That's not the experience I would say most of our kids are getting um, in Chicago. And so I think remote learning, full remote, has already created this two-tier system. Students that have resources and support, students who have strong executive functioning skills, students who have strong technological skills already come in with an advantage. Um, couple that with some of these other factors um, that are associated with poverty and you just have a perfect storm. And so again, as I stated at the top of this, we already know a lot about what this looks like in a normal environment and it wasn't great. How can we create a new system, this new system that's remote or hybrid or whatever it is, and replicate those same disparities. That's essentially what we're doing. We know that there were disparities before we're creating a new system. And across this country, we've just replicated the same disparities that were in the old system. And that's troubling to me. So I want to pivot back a little something we touched on earlier, I want to come back to, which is ventilation. You know, the prior to COVID, there was a quiet epidemic in urban areas of asthma with kids owing to poor air quality. Um, and that and, and schools are a culprit because we, we are often really old buildings with very poor air quality. I, I wouldn't want to say they're the cause, but they, they certainly don't help. They're, they're part and parcel of a larger environmental quality problem in a lot of communities. What do we need to do about ventilation? You mentioned, Janice, you're putting these things in. Emily, what are you seeing in terms of best practices and how should we think thinking about ventilation like now and, and going forward? Because that seems to be one of these things that like it is is extremely important, but wasn't something we were talking about a lot in March. Yeah, I mean, I think the the sort of good news on the ventilation side is that it is something that we can like evaluate and speak to directly. Um, so there's actually a group at Harvard and headed by a guy named Joseph Allen 
um, called like healthy buildings, um, where they've actually like, you know, tried to figure out basically using carbon dioxide in, and Joe would be much better than I talked about this, but like basically bringing carbon dioxide into classrooms, like turning it on and seeing, you know, how much does it matter if the doors open, if the windows open a little bit, what about heat filters and so on. And I think much of what he would say is that basically, you know, we can achieve this even if, you know, yes, some buildings need some updating, um, but things like keep the filters, keeping the door open, you know, opening the windows a little bit if you can, that that really like that, you know, we don't have to get to infinite ventilation um, to to improve that. Um, and that, you know, I think his sort of four to six air changes an hour is kind of where they are aiming. Um, you know, most schools are supposed to have three to start with. And so, you know, there's kind of like, and and I think, you know, what's also good there is, is though that kind of sort of science-based approach to this will tell you things like, hey, it's actually okay to have kids on the bus, which is something people are really worried about. It's okay to have kids on the bus. You gotta crack the windows a little bit, but if you crack the windows even a little bit, you know, everybody's gotta wear their jacket. I know, I'm still in Chicago, I know it gets cold, but uh, but if you crack the windows a little bit, then you're at 40 air changes an hour in the bus. People wearing masks at 40 air changes, like, it's fine. And so I think this is a place where we can really use the, like, the science, like the actual science things you can measure in, in order to, uh, to address some of these concerns. And Emily, staying with you, what are you seeing in best practice? The question I'm, I'm looking at the Q and A from some of the attendees is one, you know, states say it's a community seem to be all over the place with requiring masks for teachers and students. Like, what do we know? What is the evidence? What is the best practice there? So we have actually in our data, like the only we have places that have mask requirements and places that don't. Um, not that many places that that don't. And of course, it's hard to know if it's the mask in school or the mask out of school, but I will say that the places where there are no mask requirements, the teacher rates are really high. Um, they're much higher actually than their, than their community rates, not much true in, in the places with masks required. So I think that is something that shows up as something important. It's also, I just wanna be clear, not that big a deal. Like I don't, you know, I, I think many places, in, there were many places where they started and they were like, I can't believe we've been thinking about having kindergartners wear masks, like they'll never wear them. It's a total disaster. This is a ridiculous expectation. And then a bunch of kindergartners went back and they put the masks on their faces and it's fun. And they wear them all day and they don't complain about it. And I think, you know, Aaron Carroll, I think I was had the best thing I said, I saw about this where he said, you know, they don't want to wear pants either, but they wear them every day and they will wear their masks just like they wear their pants. Um, and they, you know, so I think that like masks are something we can do and we should do in schools. And I think that's just, you know, um, that's just that's just best practice. Um, I think let me just sort of highlight one other thing, which is when we see transmission in schools, it is often between staff members. So it is, you know, even though we kind of came into this and uh, we're thinking, oh, you know, kids are going to get sick, they're germ factories, they're going to like spread to everyone. Actually, when we do see in school transmission, it tends to be staff staff transmission, and it often happens in places where people kind of let their guard down. So you know, we take off our masks to have lunch together in the in the staff room, um, and that that isn't actually a good idea. Um, and so I think you know, partly we need there's a little bit of a sort of flip the flip the narrative here to try to tell people, hey, actually the best way for for staff to protect themselves is probably to be careful around other staff, um, which is you know both good advice, but I think also in some ways can again get back to this trust thing because that's something that I feel like I can control. Right, I feel like I can control my interactions with other adults in a way that it's harder to control my interaction with a four-year-old. And what kind of masks are we talking about here? There's been, okay, just the regular surgical, the yeah. Regular cloth and like stuff you make and whatever. Any advantage? I mean, there's been a push. Some people have said N95s, but I mean, they require a fit test. They're not. We don't have any. We don't have enough data on that, and I think that most people would say there's no need to go to that okay. level of PPE in a school. So you're talking just the regular procedure mask or the regular cloth mask? Regular procedure mask, cloth mask you make yourself. Like Great. Janice, coming back to the ventilation question with you, just as you, I mean, you talked about what you're doing immediately with putting the, in every room, but yeah. is this factoring as you guys think about your physical plant there overall going forward, how is this affecting your thinking on, on that? Yeah, I think what I was going to add to this is I think COVID has definitely 
raised awareness around a, a variety of issues and the quality of our building um, is in, uh, buildings throughout the city is important. We have a very old infrastructure here in CPS. I think the average age of our buildings is somewhere around uh, 80 to 90 years, which, you know, we're very proud of it. We have beautiful buildings, but, you know, there are some issues around modernization that come up. And I think it goes back to not only what we do locally and how we invest in schools. Um, we shifted a few years ago, uh, thank God, to pay more attention to mechanical issues as, as opposed to kind of the expansion and new building um, phenomenon that was going on for a long, a long time. But I also think it raises an issue at the federal level. There hasn't been infrastructure money for schools, I think since the 1980s. And so um, we there was a promise in the previous administration that never materialized. Um, I know the current, the new administration has promised to do something around that. But I think when we think about COVID support, we have to think about it in two different ways. First, immediate relief, which we need right now, um, but also stimulus and how do we prepare our school system for um, the, the next uh, couple of decades. And one of those pieces is definitely looking at um, the, the quality of our school building. So that's been a takeaway from this. I think coupled with that, the need for um, technological resources. I can say uh, wholeheartedly, CPS will not revert back to a place where every student doesn't have a device. We will be a one-to-one -one district with 350,000 students um, from this point forward. Um, and COVID thrusted us into that, but we see the value um, in making sure that our students are connected. And so I think those have been some of the positive things that have uh, been born out of this uh, crisis. So that's a great pivot to sort of this question about leadership that I want to ask, and then we'll bring in, um, I've got a bunch of questions queued up from the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, I don't, I don't know why anybody would have expected that education, schools, and COVID would be the one place where President Trump would be like a calming, reassuring uh, <laughs> presence. And he certainly, he certainly hasn't been. It, it, it is, it is just further fueled all these debates. But it may have also distracted from underneath. I'm struck how often when I talk to superintendents, they're extremely frustrated with state leadership, with local leadership. There's a broader sense out there mm -hmm. that, that people aren't getting what they want. Issues of if you want to have school open, what other steps you need to take in a community to control spread that people aren't taking superintendents are speaking up more about that um, support for actual operational things to be able yeah. to make schools like it's a there's a broader set of complaints. And so, like, would both of you just speak to what do we need and what are we not getting from local leaders, state leaders, national leaders? Uh, so beyond schools, so basically everybody else besides school superintendents, like. What do, what do we need if, if we want to have open live instruction schools that are effective? What do we need that we're not seeing right now? <sighs> this is this is a good how much one, how much time do we have? <laughs> I don't know because I don't you know when, as I was thinking about my response as you were speaking. I mean, it's all aspirational, which is unfortunate. I think the first thing is. Schools have to be at the center of any kind of recovery strategy for this country. Um, I haven't seen energy around that. You think about what we're going through, you know, obviously um, the economy and so many other things um, have been impacted, although not as much as we thought, you know, going into this. But if schools aren't at the center, what does that mean for this generation and the next generation? That that worries me. Um, I think the other piece, you hit on something that's important, um, the, the role of state and local government, which is critically important. And I, oftentimes, I don't think the average person knows how much um, power and influence those leaders have. And we spend our time worrying about, you know, who's the president and who's the secretary of this and that, when um, a lot of decisions get made at the local level that impact our, our daily lives. And so for our part, we just try to lift that up and make sure people know like where decisions get made and where resources come from, et cetera. I think that schools have to be at the center. I think, as I stated earlier, we need a full plan that's focused and not an afterthought or something that people do to feel good and get a good headline. There needs to be real energy um, and, and, and brain trust put behind what public education needs to look like going forward, given this crisis. And I just don't see that that leadership happening just yet. Um, I think if we get uh, relief and stimulus, people will feel like the job is done and that's insufficient. Um, I think that we need to be thinking about what's happening right now, but also what's going to happen 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that once the new leadership is selected, um, we see that kind of planning happening um, as a result. But right now, I think people think 
get money to the schools, which is incredibly important, but I think that's only one part of it. We need a vision for public education going forward. Emily, what would you add to that? Like, what are you seeing as, as, as you look around the country, see your data, what are you seeing? And also best practices, what are you seeing as sort of best practices of leadership and what are the things that we're not seeing that we need? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, this has been a, quite a learning experience about the way that schools are organized. Um, and, you know, there is like obviously a huge amount of fragmentation and so much of this has been happening at the at the district level. And I think that, you know, by and large, you know, district control, district control is important and it lets districts be, you know, lets people like Janice be really flexible in terms of like what her district needs and why that's different from, you know, what Fargo, North Dakota needs. And I don't think that we can have like one uh, you know, set of set of rules for people. But I think one of the things that, you know, for me has come out here is the realization that there may be situations in which we could be doing more learning across districts and that the sort of fragmented nature of the of the system made it very hard in this thing, in this circumstance to learn. Um, and, you know, there was no way to get a sort of like to get to, to, to use what New York was doing to, for Chicago or what Chicago was doing for Houston or, you know, what rural places across the country were doing to, for each other. And I think that, you know, when I think about kind of what would we learn from this that would help us do better, maybe in the next pandemic, but also in sort of other things that schools that schools struggle with, I think there is more of a scope for maybe trying to, to have some organization that would let us, um, you know, do more of this kind of cross district learning because I think there's a lot of information out there that's maybe being um, being lost. And, you know, even when I talked to superintendents early on, they were saying, oh, you know, we really need to know this stuff. And, and the way I'm getting information is I have a WhatsApp chat with four other superintendents in the other state. And, you know, that like superintendents getting together on a WhatsApp chat is actually probably like, I think we could improve upon that. So I want to get to some questions from attendees. Uh, one, Janice, to you, just to uh, clarify, there's a question, is Janice saying that white parents are more numerous or are more visible in demanding that kids get back to classrooms? Um, uh, and uh, and is that having a negative impact on the way black and Hispanic parents view uh, the, the wisdom or safety of sending their kids back? And then there's a related question that, so I'm gonna put them together because they're two yep. very related questions. Uh, Superintendent Jackson noticed uh, ra noted racial differences in parental support for return to in-person learning in Chicago. It's a dynamic we're seeing elsewhere in the country. Why do you think these gaps exist? And Emily, I'll ask you to speak to that latter question as, as well in a moment. But Janice, yeah. how, would you, how would you respond to, to, to those? Yeah, just so that I provide more clarity, uh, white parents make up about 11% of the population in Chicago public schools, but of the white parents, about 60% are opting for in-person instruction for, for their students. That's just a, CP, uh, a CPS number that we had uh, later. We're in the process of uh, aggregating or looking at that data for um, this upcoming reopening. But this these were some of the things that we saw um, our local uh, archdiocese uh, set of schools with about 50,000 students saw something similar. Um, and as the uh, person in the, the chat noted, this is something we're seeing city I mean, uh, throughout the country. I think what I was trying to communicate is that people are using some of the data that says, you know, white parents are more likely to opt for in-person instruction over blacks to make a case that black and Latino families don't want in-person instruction. And actually, when you look at that data a different way, it, it tells you a, a different story. So in CPS, even though we see that uh, disparity from a, um, a, from a percentage standpoint, more uh, students of color will be returning to classrooms in CPS. That's just the nature of our district and how we're organized. But I think that some of those um, statistics have been used to like make this case around, you know, what we should be doing. And of course, I think there's some real concerns with um, spread and prevalence in uh, the Black and the Latinx community. Those concerns are real. I think the lack of trust in government institutions, those are real concerns that we all have to contend with. But again, when, when we step back from this as educators, as leaders, we know that our obligation is to make sure that our kids are getting a quality education. And it's not okay to not make an effort to bring them back. That's the point that I'm making. So the plan that CPS has right now, to me, allows for choice for everybody. If you are a parent like myself who want, I want my daughter back in school, 
that is now going to be a part of the plan. But if you're someone like, you know, people that I know who want their kids to stay home, they're not yet comfortable. They now have that choice. And I think that that's the right approach if we're talking about having a truly um, equitable system. But it has been unfortunate that this decision in debate has become politicized. And it is unfortunate that it now seems to be racialized as well. So on that second part, right, where, where Janice ended, Emily, that second part of the question that's, that's broader than just Chicago, what are you seeing in your data around this and how the debate is is, is playing out? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, that one of the sort of overarching features of our data, of all of the data about reopens, is that at the moment, white students are much more likely to be in school than Black and Latinx students. And that is, uh, that is a lot of that is just about the geographic variation in opening plans that, you know, the sort of both the re like geographic, both in the sort of broad swath of the country that the kind of Midwest, parts of the Midwest more likely and South more likely to open than, um, you know, larger urban centers. And partly about just richer districts are tend to have more white people and they also tend to be more likely to be open. So when, you know, when I think there's, I see these things like, you know, well, when we open CPS, it'll be a larger share of white, of white kids who come back than, than black kids. But overall, the opening of CPS is going to bring, is going to like, reduce racial inequality in the because it contains a lot of black students and the same is true for New York and these other places. So I think it's a sort of, it, I mean, again, it kind of depends exactly what you mean by, by inequality, but if your definition of sort of racial inequality is that we are serving more white people relative to black people, then that will be addressed. That is sort of will be addressed. And I also think there is a huge distinction between offering the opportunity and not offering the opportunity and that, and respecting the choice of parents and sort of to say somehow we shouldn't open this because like the set of choices that people make aren't exactly the choices that we would think would be the most equitable. Well, for the black parents who want to have their kids back in school, we need to offer that choice. And then, you know, I think there is a, there is also an option, you know, also a chance or a hope that, you know, that when things open and, and as, you know, things are open in the trust starts to rebuild, that there will be opportunities to bring more people back. And we can't just start to do that until some people are back. It, and I know we're uh, gonna pivot to questions, but just to build on that, um, and this may come up in the chat as well, I think the next thing we have to think about too are vaccines, because oftentimes when I'm, you know, in the middle of this debate with people, you know, the question I ask is like, okay, if it's not, if now is it the time to bring ba kids back, when is it? And then people will say, well, when we have a vaccine, of course, that's what they see as seven months ago. Now that we have a vaccine, it's a completely different discussion as well, because we know we're gonna see some of the same disparities in, not only the uh, uh, ability to get in uh, the, 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 you know, just the, I'm, I'm sorry, the word is escaping me, but people having access to the vaccine will be limited, especially in the communities of color, in the poor communities. Then couple that with the issues around vaccination in our community. People, we've already seen um, polling that shows that, you know, about 40 percent of blacks are saying that they're going to even take the vaccine. And so if we know that these issues are coming down the pipeline, and when are we bringing kids back? That's really the biggest question. And I've been unable to get a real answer from people who are against bringing students back. That sounds really concrete. We know it's not just going to be uh, having a vaccine because we know that the vaccine, there are going to be issues around distribution and people um, taking the vaccine. So we have to have a real question around when can we return to in-person instruction for everybody and make that mandatory? That's a real question that I feel like we should be having more of a public debate around because people people don't seem to be thinking about it. We're only concerned about what's happening right now. Yeah, let's stay on that. So uh, Shale Polakow Soransky, who's a former big city uh, chancellor in New York, in New York City, um, and now with Bank Street, he, he, he has a question in the chat, like, looking beyond the school year and talking about like, what should we be thinking about for September? I think, I, I think it was you, Janice, earlier said some people are saying no, no return to live instruction until COVID's eradicated, which will not be the case, even if we make enormous progress next year, will not be the case in 2021. And yeah, based on the historical patterns of these things, possibly never. Um, so Shale's question is, he says, we should be honest that New York City, which is ahead of other cities, is still only providing in-person instruction for 15% of K-12 students, and most of those students are only, or those children are only attending school part-time. We won't have a vaccine for a lot of kids under 18. We're just now starting the work on, on the vaccine for kids. All the excitement today and seeing that ICU nurse who was vaccinated this morning, like it's all adults um, who, are getting, who are getting vaccinated. Um, 
Uh, so what's a modified approach to safety that's going to give parents confidence and get us back in the fall? How are you how are you all thinking that? So that's Shale's question. Mm -hmm. long, long question, but I wanted to read it. How is that giving like what do, how should we be thinking about this as we move towards the 2021 2022 school year? Yeah, uh, well, we've been having a lot of sobering conversations around that because the vaccine is not the superhero that everybody thought it would be. And people are realizing that this is a much more complex and complicated process. I think the first thing that complicates this, which is a necessity, is that this is emergency authorized usage, right? So we can't mandate that teachers or students take the vaccine the way that we can with some other vaccinations that are required in order to come into a school setting. So that in and of itself means that at least for this year, um, until we uh, until this is no longer under emergency use authorization, you know, it really will be based on us appealing to people's sensibilities around taking the vaccine, um, starting with adults and then eventually children when, whenever that's available. Um, so that means that the fall is there's a big question mark around the fall. I don't know if every district will be able to say everyone has to come back to school, um, you know, without having a hybrid model or uh, taking into consideration social distancing and masks and things like that. I think we can anticipate that the next school year. Um, we'll have a lot of the same challenges that are on the table. What I am hoping, though, is that we have more national leadership around this. Um, and when I heard um, Vice President, I mean, President elect Joe Biden say, you know, in the first 100 days, his focus is going to be on reopening schools safely, I thought, Thank you, um, because I think it starts there. Um, it shouldn't be left up to chance. It shouldn't be left up to just, you know, one governor versus a different governor. We need real leadership and direction from the top. And I think that that has made this more complicated. You know, for all the talk about distrust with government, the fact that we don't have a clear this is what we're doing now and how and when that has made this even more complicated and I think further, um, you know, made this, uh, you know, people distrust the government. And so I'm hoping that with some national leadership, there's much more clarity around that. Um, but we've been looking at some of the constraints um, and there are a lot of question marks of around what the next school year is going to look like. Emily, what would you add to that? And I saw you, I saw your jazz hands when Janice mentioned national leadership. Um, so what, what would you add to that? What do we need to be doing? What do you want to see to get us to a better place in terms of talking about this, parent confidence, all that, uh, yeah, as, we, I mean, I as think, we think about the net, which is, it seems so crazy to say as we think about the next school year? No, I mean, I think, look, there's an opportunity in the next six months um, to use, to, to sort of learn about what's going to happen in the fall. I think that there's some temptation with the vaccine for people to be like, oh, well, let's just not worry about it. We'll just come back when we're all vaccinated and like, let's just like let it go, you know? And I think the the realization of what Janice said that like, look, you know, especially for kids, like we're not likely to be in a sort of universal vaccination situation in September means that there is a lot of learning that can happen now that we can use in the fall. And I think some of that is around guidance Maybe some of that is around things like, you know, how can we use antigen testing better? You know, we may have cheaper testing options, uh, you know, when we get when we get towards the fall. I also think there's some opportunity for learning around um, around instructional modes. So, you know, I think that some districts have gone with a, a more of a bifurcated system where you're basically in person, sort of full time, five, you know, five, four or five days, like in a kind of more regular setting. And then people can opt into a virtual, like a virtual academy. So the same teachers are not dealing with both groups. That has some pluses, it has some minuses. I think that, you know, as we sort of, if we are going to be doing this for a whole nother, for more of a school year next year, thinking about the benefits of sort of simul, kind of simulcast teaching to two groups versus separating them out. That's something, that's the kind of thing I think we're going to need to, um, to do. And I think one of the things that, that leadership, better leadership here can do is collate some of, okay, like what worked, what did work. And, you know, there are a lot of people, everyone did. The fact that there was no organized leadership means everyone did totally like on their own random stuff that was just like stuff that they thought of. But uh, you know that is an opportunity to learn which of the stuff that they thought of uh, worked better or worse. And I think that's what I would really like to see us do in the next few months is to be ready. All right, we have time for two more. So a quick one, just where in your all, this is for both of you, where do the critics of reopening have a point? So where do the people who are saying, keep us, keep it remote, don't do live instruction, like it, it, where, where do they make compelling points that we need that, that, that people who want to see schools reopen need to engage with? I think that I think 
it, it has to be an individualized choice. I'm uncomfortable with any position where people are making choices for other people. Um, and, and let me give you an example. In our current model right now, there are families, we know now from our surveys, there are thousands of families who are comfortable with the plan to send their kids back to school. So how do we decide who gets to make a decision for them and how their kids are educated. These are all people that are part of our city, taxpayers who want to basically, they have a say in how their children um, are educated. So I think that there, there is a point. And if you are afraid, if you don't feel like the plan is sufficient, if you do have real concerns, you have an option here in Chicago, which is to stay remote. I don't think any district is forcing everyone to come back. Um, that'd be a different discussion. But I think when, when, when people want to make decisions for others, especially in an environment like this, where it really is a personal and individualized decision to go to the grocery store, to go out to eat, to visit family, to host things. Get, like these are, that's how we've been operating. And I just think that why is school so different? Everybody is exercising individual choice on all those other things, going to the gym, you know, going to bars, but somehow we should just, you know, lock out families who want in-person instruction. Um, I, I just don't agree with it. Emily, how would you like wh wh when you see like critics and pushback and like where 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 are places where where they where you feel like people have points that need to be engaged with? I mean, I think that you know, like the sort of the two big points I think we need to engage with are are one kind of making sure that we have concrete plans so people know what is happening and they know like how they're going to learn if there's a COVID case. Sort of transparency around. I think that's you know we haven't always been great on that, um, and I think more on that is good. And I think the second thing is. Um, you know, sometimes people raise concerns about about like the just the practicalities of the of the learning environment, um, which I think are not insurmountable, but you know deserve uh, deserve attention. And some sometimes we're so focused on the COVID safety piece, um, and I think Janice sort of alluded to this in some of the teacher union discussion. We're so focused on that that we sort of haven't gotten to the part about like how can we make the learning work. And I think sometimes teachers will come to me and say, "Look, I just I don't know how I'm going to teach in this environment, and I don't feel like I have enough." support to kind of figure it out. So those are things, and I don't think those are barriers to opening. I think that those are just things we need to think about. All right, so the last question, this is from, and this is a perfect question for you all. And it, it, it goes, you know, segues right from the last one, because you guys are both, you're, you're both, I think we can fairly characterize you as reopeners. So this person writes, I'm an educator and a parent in a small Midwestern city with a well-funded public school uh, district that is not yet reopened and is not currently planned to. Uh, other uh, other local public school districts have reopened, as have all of our private schools. How can we as parents, educators, in partnership with medical and mental health professionals, effectively advocate for opening our local public schools? What advice do you have for somebody in that situation? Again, they're an educator and a, and a parent. I mean, I think that we've seen good, um, you know, we've seen in, in a number of places, you know, parent groups be um, be effective, but we've also seen places where they aren't effective. Um, and I think, I I've increasingly think we need to pivot those conversations into, okay, what, like, what is it? You, often in those situations, the pushback is coming from staff. I think we need to get to the question of practically, what is it that you need? Um, not like, you know, here are some data that shows that you should feel like this is safe and you should feel good about it and why aren't you back? But just like, what do you need? What is it going to take to, to what can we come together on? I don't know, Janice, you, this is more like your space. Janice is the recipient, yeah. the recipient yeah. of all this lobbying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think, go, I guess I would apply some of the same things I said earlier around individual choice um, and different people think about things differently. For me, as both an educator and parent, there really is, I don't see those as being uh, different in any way. I'm, my first thought is always that of a parent. I think all parents think like that. Um, and so I don't want people to feel like there's a false choice that you have to think and believe one thing because you fall on one side of this. I also think that, um, you know, parents have a lot of power. And unfortunately, that power is exercised in different ways in different cities and different places. Um, and what I would like to see, this has just been my wish for cities like Chicago before COVID, is that our parents had more, uh, more of an ability to exercise their power. That has not been the case. And unfortunately, you know, there are forces that use that um, sometimes lack of involvement to, you know, 
insert themselves and, and, and put ideas out there. And I think it's disrespectful, just as disrespectful as not engaging parents, to be quite honest with you. And so for me, I feel like the best way to, to, to be engaged in this is to help people understand what the choices are, help them understand the information and the data, the shortcomings in that um, as well, not to just, you know, spread, spread the information and help us. Um, but to really advocate for what's best, not only for your own child, but for um, students who really don't have um, the same type of advocacy for them in their education. I mean, some of these things, I, you know, when I was a principal, I would always say, you know, it sounds good. Now I was a high school principal, but when these students turn 18 and graduate, who's looking out for them? They become, in, in the case of Chicago, more, you know, statistics meaning they're, you know, it's an African-American adult or a Latino adult, and we're not, they're not given the same advantages as other people. And so it's not okay to, to, to make decisions for them that, you know, don't position them to be in the strongest position possible when they become adults. And we shouldn't do that. I think it shouldn't, it should be the same as we think about returning to school here with COVID. We know that the students who aren't going to school, they're going to be in a disadvantage. They're going to be at a disadvantage and we have to do something about that. And we shouldn't let politics or allegiance to a job or role get in the way of doing what's right, not only, not only for our children, but for the most vulnerable students amongst us. Great. I know I said last question, but I am actually going to prerogative the moderator. Adjacent, the question is adjacent to this, this really quick lightning round that we've gotten a few questions on. I'm curious for your take on it. Youth sports and school sports, where do they fit into this? <laughs> this is, I laughed only because <laughs> This is a place where parents do speak up. Now, we, you know, we would make a decision about closing schools or opening them. And, you know, we already talked about what those dynamics look like. But when we made a decision, whenever it was a, a, a new update related to sports, whew, you, I mean, across the board, parental and community involvement and input was coming through to, you know, uh, coming from every which way. <laughs> I think that the state of Illinois has been really responsive um, and mainly because, you know, even though Chicago is a very blue city, the state is, you know, there are some places so our governor had to walk a really tight line with that. And so what we did is limited contact sports. So like football, basketball, which was not popular because those are the two most popular sports in, in this country, probably, but definitely in this state. Um, those have been uh, postponed until the spring. And, you know, we hope they will happen. But we did allow for a lot of the individualized sports to occur. And I think that was the right balance. Um, I don't have a lot of. Uh, I don't have any updates on like where I think we should go with regard to like football and some of the other contact sports. I think there we need more data around what happens there. I do know um, that that's something that our state is paying a lot of attention to because there are a lot of people who feel like there are opportunities they're, they're going to miss out on if they don't have an opportunity to play. But I think we've done a good job of kind of walking a the line. There are some opportunities to play, um, but some of the ones that people think are more dangerous to have been limited. Emily, anything that you're seeing in your data? Any, adv any advice? We don't, from have that. we don't have that in their data, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a pass. <laughs> All right. Well, terrific. Janice, you are on Twitter and on your website. There's a, a variety of ways for people want to be able to get communications from the Chicago Public Schools. The Teachers Union has their own newsletter, and they blast stuff out for people who want to follow from that side. Anything else that people want to follow your work, Janice, that you suggest? Um, yeah, no, uh, CPS is a uh, Twitter handle. You can find me at Janice Jackson on Twitter. Um, that's our primary mode of um, communication, communicating on social media. Oh, and also Facebook as well. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, Facebook for those of us like over 40. Um, Emily, uh, what about you? People want to follow your work and keep up with what you're doing. What's the best way to do that? Twitter. Prof Emily Oster at Twitter. Uh, and I have a, I have a newsletter that I write called Parent Data on Substack. On sub, okay, so you're on Substack too. Okay, I'm so Substack. Substack, that newsletter. And for both uh, Janice's and Emily's Twitter handles, if you didn't get that, if you go to the Bellwether feed, they're both tagged in uh, a number of tweets about this webinar, so you can find them uh, there. You all, thank you very much again thank for taking you. your time out, Emily, Janice, for being with us. Really appreciate it. Uh, this conversation, I, I think, uh, will continue over the next few months. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks for hosting Thanks. us. All right, bye. Bye-bye.